please welcome to the stage Dr. Kim Prather. Well, hello. Um, I, it's my pleasure to, to be here today to describe a little bit about the research we've been doing at UC San Diego, um, focusing on airborne pathogens, detecting them and mapping them and trying to understand how they move around. So I think I will start out with just sort of uh, the paradigm shift that has occurred in our thinking about disease transmission over the last few years. I've been sort of the, one of the voices of COVID is airborne. Uh, it's how I've spent a huge fraction of my time, too much. I keep saying I have a day job, but this has been my distraction. The move, the shift has gone from thinking about disease being spread in droplets, which is in all medical textbooks, to aerosols. And aerosols are what I study, as I'll talk about today. I mean, to aerosol scientists, we came in, Medical field wasn't exactly sure that we were super welcome, uh, but it was obvious to us from the beginning that this, this virus was spreading in aerosols because people weren't coughing and sneezing, they were just talking. And you produce thousands of aerosol particles just by, by speaking. And if you're sick, they will contain the virus. And when you don't have any symptoms, you don't know you're sick. And so that's one of the ways that this virus has snuck around the globe. And so I um, wrote a perspective in science. That's how I got sucked in. Um, sort of why masks are so important, why people, both people wearing masks, source control is key. So blocking it just in case you're sick is important. And then, you know, basically, I wrote a, we wrote a letter, again, with other MDs that I sort of pulled to the team, so it wasn't just aerosol scientists lecturing medical doctors. Um, and we basically changed the cut, the size cut. What people thought before and where the six feet rule came from was, was that if it was in droplets, droplets kind of come out and spray when you cough and sneeze and they fall to the ground. But aerosols do not. Aerosols behave much more like cigarette smoke. And so if you're in a room with someone who's infectious, poor ventilation, they just build up, and that is how this virus has gotten around. And it's a total, the frustrating part for me is to this day, you know, it's still confusing. You walk in and what do you see? You see hand sanitizer. You know, you don't see filtration. And it's a totally fixable problem. We didn't have to be in this pandemic. We should be cleaning our indoor air just like we filter our water. And then finally, in June of 2021, we wrote a review on all respiratory viruses. And the fact is that most respiratory viruses are airborne and travel in aerosols. And that sounds funny to say that, to pro proclaim that was a big deal. Um, it seems obvious that you inhale them, that's how you get infected. Inhalation leads to, often leads to the worst infection, the most severe outcomes compared to touching things on a surface. And so it's something we really need to think more about. And so, you know, it's not just SARS-CoV-2. The original SARS-CoV was, was airborne, we knew that. And somehow we forgot. And, you know, we, we basically, you know, influenza, you name it, all of these viruses are airborne. And so it's raised awareness. And so what, you know, what basically what I do and where I come, came at this problem is I direct a National Science Foundation Center called CASE, the NSF Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment. And basically in this, we basically moved the ocean into the lab because the ocean, believe it or not, covers nearly three quarters of our Earth, is the least understood component and we wanted to isolate it so we could study what the aerosol puts into the atmosphere, mostly from a climate perspective and a water perspective, but now it's important from a health perspective as well. So I'll just give you a little video of a facility that's just been launched this last summer. Actually, there's no sound. That's not gonna be as good. SOARS stands for the Scripps Ocean Atmosphere go. Research Simulator. It's an instrument funded by the National Science Foundation, supported by UC San Diego. So this is sort of the whole shebang. This allowed us to move the physics, the chemistry, the biology. We use real seawater. We can go up to hurricane force winds and study the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. It's the only su such system in the world. And it's a facility that we're proud to have here and share here at UC San Diego. So what are we doing with this big facility now that we have it. And the, one of the main things we're doing that's relevant to this talk is understanding aerosolization, which is super important, obviously, from a national security perspective, from a health perspective. I mean, there's so many reasons understanding aerosolization is important. Turns out people were doing it wrong. It's actually really hard to get the right bubbles. And so with waves, you do. And you can see there's just a massive number of bubbles. Turns out there's a very characteristic number of, part, number of bubbles, the size of the bubbles. It's all well-defined. 
for a breaking wave. And so that, because it's such a surface selective process, that's what transfers, or not, things into the atmosphere, which turns out to be an incredibly selective process. And so, you know, basically, if you zoom in on the top where the bubbles are, you can see that there's film drops and jet drops. These give you completely different compositions. They're what transfer different bacteria, different viruses to the air. We did this. We finally, it took us a few years working with oceanographers to get it right. And one of the things we found, and these are actual images, cryo-electron microscopy images, of things that we actually detected in the air. Intact microbes come out very enriched, up to 10,000 times higher in the air relative to their concentrations in water. And so, you know, this has been a really big part of our center. And so as we sort of came into, you know, this pandemic, we started thinking about, well, what else? would be maybe in the air that we've always thought of as being in the water. And the first candidate that comes to mind is cholera. If I asked you, is cholera waterborne or airborne, you would say waterborne. There's nothing. I talked to Rita Caldwell, who's, this was her life's work. And it, you know, I said to her, how do we know it's not airborne? She said, we don't. So we were able to, in smaller simulators, basically this little device that's shown on the left, we were able to run this, you can see a little spiller comes out, that creates the right bubble, same as a breaking wave, that transfers the cholera into the, or the mimic for the Vibrio cholera into the air. Turns out it's incredibly efficiently transferred, and not only is it efficiently transferred, it remains viable in the air, as you can see by the growth on the plate to the right. And so this is a huge, dis you know, huge discovery, and it really has massive implications that you know, cholera has always been, you know, basically been, as I said, classified as waterborne, but now we have to think about the airborne in, in implications and what happens if we inhale it nobody knows and so you know going at you know, what's in the real world we moved to an area down in the southern part of um, San Diego down by the Mexican border and you can see that this is a region where you know millions of gallons of raw sewage pours into the ocean especially after rains you know, we care about these zones because this is where most of the people live, it has huge national security implications because once things get out of the ocean into the air, millions more people are exposed. We always worry about our surfers and swimmers. These beaches are closed down over 50% of the days, but we don't shut off our air, right? And so, and it just will go all the way for miles. And so one of the things we found was that when we released a dye into the surf zone, we found out that on days when it gets trapped in the surf zone, that's the days we see it everywhere we look in the air in San Diego. Days where it goes out, the image on the right, we don't see it. And so we've started to understand this and started to look for which pathogens are out there. And you know, there's just a huge cocktail. And so that's just one place, but it's representative of all coasts all places where you have flooding. And this is gonna become more and more important as climate changes and we get more and more extreme weather events. And so what we need is a map. We need that, that view of you know, the aerosol circulating, that's dust and pollution. We need to add microbes to that. We have the technologies to do that. And so it's gonna take a huge team effort with data scientists, engineers, you name it, to actually solve this problem. But we need to be monitoring these things in real time. And we are, you know, basically we need to be doing that now. So thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Victor Nize. Okay, great to be here. Um, my name is Victor and I'm a physician scientist and for the last 25 years my lab at UCSD has done basic research on bacterial pathogens in the immune system. Uh, hoping to translate uh, discoveries into new therapies and vaccines. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a project at the interface of nanoengineering and infectious disease research. And for the last six years, I've been collaborating with UCSD professor of nanoengineering, Liang Fang Zhang, uh, translating his novel biomimetic membrane-coated nanotherapies into the infectious disease realm. Here, we are taking the membranes of any human cell and coating them onto a nanoparticle at 1 50,000th scale, with the outside of the nanoparticle being a faithful representation of the parent cell. One example of this are human red blood cell nanoparticles or nanosponges, 
which absorb bacterial toxins and have now received FDA allowance to move into phase one, two human clinical trials as the first drug in which a membrane is the active component uh, to treat staphylococcal pneumonia. Or macrophage nanosponges, where the toll receptors and cytokine receptors on the nanosponge uh, are able to capture pro-inflammatory bacterial components and cytokines to calm the uh, cytokine storm of sepsis and uh, supported by CARB-X now in IND enabling phases. And both of these programs have been heavily supported by DARPA and uh, by um, BARDA. So I'm going to talk today about the threat of antibiotic resistance, uh, which really uh, threatens the practice of modern medicine as reaffirmed by the WHO Secretary General just this week. Um, the uh, superbugs uh, that are both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria uh, exert uh, an enormous uh, financial burden, and they strike the most vulnerable patients like babies, the elderly, uh, those with compromised immune systems undergoing surgery. And under the current trajectory, uh, the one million deaths per year globally of antibiotic resistance is expected to expand tenfold by uh, 2050, where it would exceed cancer and HIV combined as a cause of human mortality. One example is Acinetobacter baumannii, which is named the number one resistant threat by the CDC and the WHO, and emerged as a major cause of life-threatening infections in war fighters in the Iraq and Afghanistan theaters. It's frequently resistant to the last-line antibiotics, the carbapenems, and can cause pneumonia, sepsis, wound infections, and urinary tract infections with a very high rate of treatment failure, up to 30% or more mortality in severe disease. In fact, this is the pathogen that nearly took the life of our own professor, Tom Patterson, and uh, under the leadership uh, of his wife, an effort to uh, introduce phage therapy to save uh, his life and uh, uh, extract him from a coma uh, led to our IPATH here at UCSD, the first clinical phage therapy center. Acinetobacter baumannii is also a major cause of complicating pneumonias in ICU patients uh, with COVID. There is no vaccine for Acinetobacter baumannii, nor is there a vaccine uh, for any of the superbugs I mentioned. Um, and um, you know, we've seen how vaccine technology, novel antiviral vaccine technology in the COVID pandemic saved millions of lives, allowed us to recur return to economic and educational activities. And, um, and uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a rapid uh, technology for uh, vaccine development in this context? And our idea is nanoparticle vaccines and membranes, this time not coming from the host cell, but from the bacteria themselves. Because bacteria shed little bits of their membrane when they're stressed. We call these outer membrane vesicles, and many laboratories, including my own, study the role of these outer membrane vesicles and the cargo they carry in biology and infectious diseases. In fact, uh, there is one vaccine for certain strains of meningococcal meningitis that includes outer membrane vesicles along with some recombinant proteins in its formulation. But the whole field is stymied because although they're very immunogenic, uh, the, vaccine, uh, the nanoparticles are very heterogeneous and have stability problems, which a drug company is not interested in uh, dealing with. So our idea is to capture and stabilize outer membrane vesicles from bacteria, starting with Acinetobacter, here on gold particles that are precision engineered to be the optimal size to be taken up by immune cells. We found that these uh, uh, nanoparticles are uh, precisely coated and stable on the surface of the bacteria and represent all the bacterial proteins as opposed to the heterogeneous OMV preparation. And when we immunize rabbits with these nanoparticles, they 
develop robust antibody responses, and those antibodies, when we gave them to human neutrophils, uh, accelerated their killing of the pathogen and protected uh, rabbits against infection. We could do uh, immunization and boosting in mice and get very high titers of uh, immune response in the mice. And these mice are completely protected against lethal challenge in acinetobacter pneumonia and sepsis models associated with 10,000-fold reductions in the bacterial counts in the blood. We've now moved on to show that this technology works also for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a major nosocomial pathogen uh, that causes infections in CF patients and ICUs and cancer patients. And uh, the antibody titers are high, the protection is high. We're introducing specific adjuvants into the core, which are delivered in a one-to-one -one ratio with the uh, vaccine to the bacteria. And now we've discovered that gram-positive bacteria can be stimulated to release outer membrane vesicles like MRSA. And we've shown that these outer membrane vesicles are immunogenic and therefore could be adapted into this platform. So with that, I want to thank the amazing environment at UCSD. I think we're the go-to uh, place for anybody working on antibiotic resistance. We have the collaborative to halt antibiotic resistant microbes, a pandemic uh, response unit called PREPARE, amazing collaborative science, and it's all over campus, the medical school, the pharmacy school, engineering, and the basic sciences. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Omar Akbari. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here today. And I just want to start off by saying um, some of you may think that the world's deadliest animal is perhaps a shark. But in fact, that's not true. And really, the world's deadliest animal is a mosquito. And the reason it's so deadly is because it transmits so many different pathogens that can affect our health. Here's an example of some of the pathogens like malaria, dengue fever, Zika virus, West Nile, chikungunya. These are just some of the pathogens that a mosquito can transmit. It's estimated that half of the world's population is presently at risk of being infected by a mosquito-borne pathogen. And if we just look at malaria alone, we have about 1,000 people dying every single day. And that equates to um, and those are mostly children under the age of five, and that equates to a child dying every two minutes. It's unacceptable. So, um, we're in a pandemic, and we know that COVID is airborne transmissible, and I see some of you with masks on. But in some ways, I think we dodged a huge bullet in that it's not transmitted by mosquitoes. But what if it were? And what if the next pandemic is? How are we gonna protect ourselves? So, this is the, the current practices for mosquito uh, protection rely on these methodologies. The first line of defense is to prevent contact. And we can do that by using insect repellents, by spreading that on our skin. We can use bed nets. We can use lures and traps. We can modify the environment. We understand that mosquitoes lay their eggs in standing water. So if we can reduce the occurrence of standing water, we can reduce populations in that way. We can use insecticides and larvicides, things that kill the mosquitoes in the water before they emerge as an adult or spray the adults in the air and kill them that way. We can use pathogen, remo pathogen removal drugs, things like artemisin, which are used to in throughout Africa today. And then there's new technologies that rely on genetics to control mosquitoes. And there's some companies that are doing experimental trials of these technologies, even here in the United States, a tech company called Oxitec. And the point I wanna make here is that while all of these approaches are essential for sustained control, they all have issues. Repellents, bed nets, lures, and traps, these require continuous application, and people have to actually use them. Um, modifying the environment, this is not practical in many cases. Insecticides and larvicides and pathogen removal drugs, uh, mosquitoes and the pathogens have evolved resistance to many of these. And the genetic technologies used today are not sustainable. So what we need to do is actually invest in better technologies to control mosquitoes. And so here at UCSD, our lab is working on a number of different approaches to engineer uh, to protect against mosquito-borne pathogens. And we were fortunate enough to be um, a performer with DARPA Safe Genes. And in DARPA Safe Genes, which just ended this year, 
we were able to engineer mosquitoes that are unable to transmit pathogens. And we were also able to engineer mosquitoes um, in such a way that we can scale them and deploy them into environments and use them to um, suppress populations and eradicate mosquitoes specifically. And these are technologies that we're working to transition out of our lab and into the field. And we're looking for transition partners, actually. Um, we're also a performer for DARPA Revector, which is a really cool program. The idea is to, to build a new type of insect repellent, because the ones we use aren't great. And it turns out that mosquitoes really like to, they, they hone in on the um, odor that gets emitted from our skin. And that odor is derived from skin colonizing bacteria. So with DARPA Revector, what we're doing is we're engineering skin colonizing bacteria to emit odors that mosquitoes are repelled by. And so the idea is that you could apply a long-lasting repellent to your skin maybe once a month and, and be protected for a long time. And then we have a new project that we just started recently, and it involves this idea that in the wild, mosquitoes actually get their primary food source or energy from flowers. So what if we were to engineer the flowers to emit toxins in their nectar that when mosquitoes come and feed on them, mosquitoes would die? So we have some ways to do this, and we're working on this right now. All right, so what's my take home message from this talk? Um, if we look at innovation and we look at the cell phone as an example, the cell phone from the 60s looks nothing like the cell phone of today. There's been a lot of innovation there. When you look at how mosquitoes were controlled in the 60s and you look at how they're controlled today, there's not a lot of innovation. We're still spraying insecticides that are harmful to us into the environment. We need to we need to focus on new innovations, and I'm hoping over the next several years, you'll start to see technologies that we're developing roll out into the environment and protect us and prevent people from getting diseases and saving lives. With that said, I want to thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Wei Sheng. Hello. So I'm going to actually switch topic by not talking about disease, but talking about fundamental chemical physics that could eventually lead us to some applications in disease detection. What I'm going to talk about a pluriton chemistry, I also refer to that as the second quantum revolution for chemistry. So we all know, familiar with the first quantum revolution that had happened 100 years ago in physics, where people found to describe the microscopic world, they need to use particle wave duality, uncertainty principles, and other principles, that is the quantum mechanics. Although those principles are discovered based on fundamental scientific curiosity, it still has a huge impact in our current modern technology, including the most recently Nobel Prize win Corel electron microscope that use the particle wave duality principle, as well as NMR and MR a technique that widely used in uh, biomedical and biophysics uh, research that use the concept of spin that is a, only a concept in quantum mechanics. At the same time, chemistry also witnessed its own quantum revolution that involves you know, the concept of hydrogen bound um, uh, 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 hybridization as well as molecular orbital theory. Using those theory, we now know that the generation of any molecules involve having atoms getting close to each other and form a chemical bond, and that's the concept of hybridization. We still use it to design chemistry and control them nowadays. We're now actually in an era of second quantum revolution, people call it. And that also started from physics, thanks to that we can precisely control the quantum state of fundamental particles so that it would lead our or atoms that would lead us to um, do quantum simulation, quantum computing, te uh, teleportation, as well as quantum sensing. What about the second quantum revolution in chemistry? What I want to introduce you is this idea of pluriton chemistry, okay? That is really a new quantum concept. What it is is that when molecules are hybridized with a quantized photonic mode, it can generate a new quasi-particles that is called pluriton. And those pluriton has distinct energy and wave function from those molecular uh, excitations or modes that would change the property of the molecule. Okay, it is quantum because it involves this idea of quantum a uh, quantized uh, photonic mode that is a concept from quantum electrodynamics. Because of that, 
people have predicted and partially uh, show that polyurethane can modify chemistry that would have in, um, applications in catalysis, photosynthesis, energy transfer, photonic device, so on and so forth. So one example is a recently publication from Thomas Epperson's group, the pioneer of this field, to show that when they put a molecule that I, recall, I call as R here into the cavity and have it hybridized with the photonic structure, the selectivity and the reactivity of the reaction has been totally modified. So that gives you a complete new concept using the photonic structure to control chemistry. However, just like there was cloud when pe before people discovered quantum mechanics, there were also cloud in polyurethane chemistry. That is, so far we don't have a mechanism that can actually use to guide and predict re whether reaction can be modified by polyurethane or by photonic structures. Okay, this problem is deeply rooted in the theory or the physics of polyurethane. That is, I told you there are polyurethane mode, but coexisting there are also so-called dark mode. So polyurethane are delocalized and have different energy states. So they certainly are different from pure molecular mode, and you can regard them as a Superman or Wonder Woman in this cavity, okay? So it can change chemistry. However, the dark mode are just like regular molecular state. So they are normal people. And you don't expect that they go out there and then change you know, the chemical reactions. But the ratio or the population between the polyurethane and dark mode are so different. So for every two polyurethane mode, there is 10 to the tenth of dark mode there, okay? So the question are why polyurethane is so magical and what are the roles of dark modes? So we developed a technique to be able to resolve the polyurethane and dark modes separately that is called 2D IR spectroscopy. As you can see from the spectrum, the upper UP or LP, the upper and lower polyurethane has distinct spectral signature compared to the D state that is a dark mode. And using that, we study fundamental chemistry. One of them is a pseudo-rotation or isomerization of this molecule, iron pentacarbonyl. Using that, we find the following funding. So for this molecule, without putting it into the cavity and experience the photonic mode, the dynamics is like the right dotted curve. Okay, but if a polyurethane is formed inside the cavity, the dynamic become the blue dotted curve. You can see the dynamics clearly accelerated. But for those dark mode coexist with the polyurethane mode, it's the gray dotted dots that are exactly the same as the red dots. Okay, that means the following. So inside of this polyurethane environment, Polyurethane indeed can, verify, uh, can modify chemistry. We prove that experimentally. However, we also clarify a big question in this field that is the dark mode are just regular. They don't change any of the chemical uh, reactions or chemical dynamics. This is very important because it laid a foundation to help people to further rationally design the cavity structures and further modify chemistry. We have also done other works that show why polyurethane are magical. In this work, we show that polyurethane can actually facilitate energy transfer. So just like before technology such as uh, internet, that you cannot transfer message far distance or not easily. In molecule, it's very difficult to actually transfer vibrational energy between molecules because it loses energy to other channels. And this is evidence from this upper right spectrum I showed you here. There is a lack of, you know, a peak, a circle by this dashed square or this uh, red cross, okay? But what we find is if we put it into the cavity environment and from polyurethane, polyurethane can actually facilitate energy transfer, much like how internet enables us to actually talk through across the globe, especially during pandemic. And we, we see that signal by seeing that red square, uh, the, the peak that I labeled as a red square, okay? So this allows us to show that what polyurethane can do is uh, tra transfer energy between molecules across space. And it's a new channel of energy transfer that could be used to explain a lot of those chemical reactions being modified by polyurethane, uh, as well as design new um, uh, pathways to control chemistry. So moving forward, I think there is a huge opportunity from both fundamental science side and also the application side to prevent technology and security surprises for polyurethane chemistry. From the fundamental side, we still need to develop the theory to understand the polyurethane and be able to predict and then guide um, chemistry. 
From the technology side, this is the first time that people start to use photonic structures to control chemistry. So that allows us to use a lot of those nanotechnology and the photonic structure has been developed in the ECE department or telecommunication to try to control chemistry, even reach topological state, and eventually develop those miniaturized sensors with molecular specificity for diseases. So this is our work, and uh, well, I guess I missed the slide here. Thank you. Mm. So it's done by a small team. The work actually started by DARPA and then now carried by uh, Air Force, NSF, and, uh, uh, and Sloan Foundation. And thank you for your attention. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Steinmetz. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, to get started, um, plant viruses against cancer. Uh, my conflicts of interest, and now we get started. So in my lab, we start out by growing plants, and we use plants as bioreactors to produce nanoparticles, namely plant viruses. So when I think about a virus, I don't see or think about infectious disease. All I see is a tool, a platform technology that we can engineer to impart new functionalities targeting human health and plant health. Plant viruses are nanoscale objects that interface with the immune system, that interface with mammalian cells, that didn't evolve to interface with the mammalian system, but we can repurpose and engineer them with properties to do so. Now, given the uh, limited time we have here today, I will focus on just one story, and that is how we repurposed a plant virus as a cancer immunotherapy. And I start out by explaining the cancer immunity cycle. The cancer immunity cycle is the body's own defense against cancer. When a tumor develops, eventually a tumor cell will undergo cell death. And this happens for all sorts of reasons. We'll run out of nutrients, run out of oxygen. We have specialized immune cells sitting with all the tissues, within all of the tissues, including tumors, that will sample the contents of dying cells. These immune cells will realize something is wrong. There's proteins mutated or proteins overexpressed that shouldn't be expressed. So these immune cells will now traffic to the lymph nodes to connect with the second line of defense, the adaptive immune system, train immune cells to look for these signatures, tumor-associated signatures, and attack and kill these tumor cells. So with this cancer immunity cycle in check, our own body can control and defend against cancer. Aggressive cancers will shut down the cancer immunity cycle and escape this mechanism. So what we thought we could do is utilize a plant virus to restart the cancer immunity cycle. And the idea was that we could take a plant virus that is non-infectious towards mammals, but has all the bells and whistles to be recognized by the immune system, inject it directly into a tumor to launch systemic anti-tumor immunity. And this works. Um, we've tested this in mouse models of melanoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, and, and so on, you see on the slide. It's important to understand that this is a localized treatment but it has systemic efficacy. So what you see here in the slide is uh, the, the first image shows a, a dermal melanoma that was treated by injection of the plant virus directly into the melanoma. Three days after, we already see a response. The tumor collapses. There is no toxin added. The plant virus itself is not toxic to the tumor cells. All it does, it awakens the immune system within, and the immune cells kill the tumor cells. It's systemic efficacy. If I take a mouse with two tumors, I only treat one tumor, both tumors respond. So we call this the abscopal effect. And we have a vaccine effect. We are generating immune memory. Um, the immune system remembers these signatures from the tumor cells, and they will fight also after, after an animal is cured and rechallenged with the disease. So we have a potent response. We have systemic efficacy, and a durable response. We have advanced this treatment towards the treatment of canine patients, so somebody's pet diagnosed with cancer. 
We've treated more than 40 canine patients to date and all responded well to the treatment with no apparent side effects and all responded to the treatment and that we, we were able to cure, in some cases, the disease or control the disease. This is an ongoing trial in Spain uh, where we're treating canine patients with breast tumors or mammary tumors. Um, these patients um, will undergo surgery. That's the standard of care. It's somebody's pet, so we don't want to withhold standard of care. So when, when they are seen, a surgery will be scheduled. And we had a control group. These are uh, pets that only received the surgery. All of these animals die within one to two years due to recurrence of the disease. The treated animals received two treatments of the plant virus, cowpea mosaic virus, or in short CPMV, injected directly into the tumor. Within just two weeks, we see the tumor shrinking. Not just the tumor that was treated, but also the distant metastatic sites. So within just two weeks, there's a very potent rapid response, and all the animals that received our treatment pre-surgery are still alive to date. Um, this is now almost three years, uh, two to three years ago. So how, how does it work? Well, we take a plant virus, the cowpea mosaic virus, we inject it directly into a tumor. What happens is the plant virus is recognized by immune cells, taken up by these immune cells, and it engages with what we call toll-like receptors. These are highly conserved innate, um, innate immune receptors. And even though it's a plant virus, it still agonizes these receptors. This essentially triggers an antiviral program within the tumor, yet there's no viral infection. So the immune cells that get recruited to look for viral infection, they're activated, they're looking to do something, they in turn take care of the tumor cells. They initiate tumor cell killing, um, which leads to processing of these tumor-associated antigens, which launch, launches adaptive immunity to control disease anywhere within the body. So with a plant virus, repurposing a plant virus, we were able to, to develop a potent, systemic, and durable cancer immunotherapy. So to close the cycle, I think all we're really doing, we didn't develop a more toxic drug. Um, we, we developed a therapeutic that interfaces with the body, that interfaces with the immune system to activate and program the immune system and restore normal function. With this, I'd like to thank um, all my co-workers, my, my lab, uh, as well as collaborators and funding. Thank you very much.